How do we have to change to stay relevant? Of course, the new technologies help to get in, in keep in contact with our visitors. So, of course, museums today have to be in a certain way digital. We cannot be just analogous anymore. I think museums still um, have to embrace technology much more as they do. Some museums, some directors, have kind of a love-hate relationship with the term innovation. We are really um, working dif differently with the collection. We are more focusing on the process um, than on already knowing the result, what's coming out, or we are not producing something and then presenting it like an exhibition. You have the grand opening and then you wait. Um, here we are more in a dialogue, in a process. I sometimes question if we should, um, you know, shrink rather than grow. Create open spaces to have the possibility to, to learn, to listen, I think that's important. Listening to, to the communities which are relevant, for example, and um, have the possibilities, give the possibility and um, reflect on that. I think that's, that's really important. Welcome to the International Museum Day 2023 panel discussion, where we gather to explore and celebrate the evolving landscape of museum practice. On this special occasion, we extend the warmest gratitude to our esteemed hosts, the Museum für Kunst and Gewerbe uh, Hamburg, uh, for graciously hosting this event. Today, we come together as a global community of museum professionals, experts, and enthusiasts to delve into the exciting realm of new museum practices, sharing insights, experiences, and innovative approaches shaping the future of cultural organizations. It is through collaboration and open dialogue that we continue to push the boundaries of what museums can achieve, and we are delighted to host you with us today. I'm Lauren Vargas, and I'm an independent researcher and consultant. I am currently focused on exploring digital civility and the role museums play in shaping public and private digital spaces. I am joined today by Professor Wittke Ant, Director of the Übersee Museum Bremen and President of the German Museum Association. Dr. Felicia Sternfeld, Managing Director of Europacious Hansa Museum Lübeck and President of ICOM Deutschland. And Professor Tolga Beierle, Director of the Museum for Kunst and Gewerbe Hamburg. All right. So I've asked the panelists to give a more proper introduction as they answer the questions throughout today's discussion. The way that we have planned today's discussion is they should be talking to each other, not just myself. <laughs> so if they want to comment on, on anybody's responses, they can do so. And we'll be in conversation for about the first 40 minutes or so. And then we're gonna open it up for questions and observations to you. So please make sure you capture those questions and we'll get to those at the end. All right, are we ready? Okay, let's, let's delve into it. All right, how can museums balance the need to innovate and stay relevant with persevering or preser preserving the traditional aspects of the museum experience that visitors value? Vitka, would you like to get us started? Well, I, I would say museums are usually not the ones being innovative in a technolo te technological sense that they're pushy things forward, but they're very good in picking up trends and adapt them for the museum world because we have always to see what museums are for. They are for people who should come here. We need new technologies, but we not always need the newest on market. Uh, we need um, um, technologies which are stable, which are good, usable for us. Um, in a sustainable manner, um, but um, of course the new technologies help to get in, in, keep in contact with our visitors. So of course museums today have to be in a certain way digital. We cannot be just analogous anymore. I find it super interesting. You said one really important sentence because sometimes museums do forget about it. We're here for people. Mm -hmm. That's what we what, what we are about because. Um, you know, very often when you talk to sometimes, you know, the way what the museum is, it's all about preserving, conserving, and, and it can be very uh, traditional and conservative. And I totally agree that uh, we, we it's, it's an interesting um, moving forward and trying to stay at the same time what we're doing because 
obviously we want we need to change but because the questions of society changes we need to go more digital because we want to reach other people that cannot come we want to open our museums but i'm also very often asked when i say oh, i would like to you know have let's say workshops move into the building so we can actually do something together people say but is it still a museum or if i would say i would like to have uh, communities using spaces is it then still a museum and i find it a really interesting question how far can you go before losing um, what is a museum about, or is that what a museum is about? Well, if you talk about people and a museum, I think it's a relevant question. I think museums still um, have to embrace technology much more as they do. I mean, you said it's not the, doesn't have to be the brand news maybe, but um, it is important, I think, for museums to, to be positive about it and um, to start using them. Experimenting is very um, important, I think. And also um, maybe doing experimental formats uh, in pop-up exhibitions, for example, and try to, to um, get connections. And um, I think collaboration is very important with um, audiences, communities, and so on to, um, you know, to, to get the connection and to stay uh, relevant. But I think you wanted us also to, <laughs> to introduce ourselves a little bit. Please, yeah. <laughs> okay, we forgot about that. <laughs> okay, I'll ask you a we follow jumped question right, and we, we can jumped go right <laughs> into it. I like it. We're, we're to the point. <laughs> yes. Sh shall I start? Yes. yes. Yeah, my name is Felicia Sternfeld, and um, I'm art historian. I studied in Regensburg, Paris, and Münster. And uh, my first work experience was basically in the art market. So um, I worked for an auction house and for a gallery and was head of an um, art fair for a couple of years in uh, South Germany, one of the biggest art fairs in Germany. And then I changed sides and <laughs> uh, became director of a museum in Lübeck, of a puppet theater museum. This is why it was very interesting to see the Se Sesame Street exhibition mm -hmm. right now, because it's about puppets. And that exhibition was in, uh, that uh, museum was in Lübeck, and um, it belongs to a foundation, which is also in Lübeck, and this is why I took over a year later the European Hansen Museum. This is in very short my background. Excellent. Well, that's super interesting that you changed sides because exactly. <laughs> you could say so. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you did, and I did the same thing because I'm originally a trained designer, and then I started. I was teaching, later curating design exhibitions, and I founded a design festival which I ran for seven years, and then I moved into the museum world and I still like the little bit outside of you to it because mm -hmm. it gives me a, you know, a, 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 a good distance in a way to sometimes wonder. I mean, I love collections. I'm really fond of collections and of objects, it, but I always was even before I became a museum director. So I completely understand and I start to understand why people in museums are you know, they're so connected to their collections that they, they are almost, you know, they're like bonded to them. Mm. If you take them away, they, they, they get nervous. Or if you, <laughs> if you put them in, you know, you jeopardize their security, they get very nervous. I find this very, very interesting still, but sometimes I also find it tiring, <laughs> I also have to <laughs> say so. Um, yeah, so I, take, I took over the Kunstgewerbe Museum in Dresden in um, 2014 and I stayed almost five years in Dresden before moving to Hamburg um, late 2018. So I'm here almost five years now and I uh, love the job of <laughs> being in museums, doing great exhibitions. Well, I, I didn't really change sides, <laughs> I <laughs> made a circle. <laughs> uh, my name is Wiebke Arndt, I'm director of the Übersee Museum in Bremen for now 21 years about, longer than I ever thought. Um, and uh, I'm trained as a Mesoamericanist and social anthropologist specialized in the colonial period of Mexico. Mm. And I always thought when I made my first steps in the museum that this time period is over because museums are in the in nowadays in modern times in the 20th and now 21st century and now after one life circle I'm back to the colonial period <laughs> uh, not so much of the 16th century um, which is the most fascinating still but more to the 19th and early 20th century so I'm back to the colonial period which I never expected. Um, so in Mexico, the indigenous people say life is a circle. Mm -hmm. And now I can agree, life is a circle. <laughs> I made the move around. But coming to objects, I, when I was a student in American studies, I, I didn't believe in museum objects. I, I found museums 
a dusty space. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started giving my first guiding tour, getting finances for my PhD, um, I suddenly f realized that it's possible on one object, one piece, one vase, to explain all of the social and economic world mm. of the Mayas, for example. That's where I started in the beginnings of the 90s. And that there are even people paying for it to listen to what <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> and that was <laughs> so fascinating that this is possible, that you can take material culture, material heritage, and explain on one single object so many different aspects mm -hmm. of life. And that, in my whole study period before, where I always had to study these objects for certain reasons, I never realized that this is possible and that this is possible for, for people who didn't study the same as I, that who just came to come to the museum because they, they are um, curious what they see and fascinated by the object, and then you can open up a whole new world. And when I figured that, and this is now 30 years ago, yeah, I got stuck. I wanted <laughs> <laughs> never again to leave a museum. <laughs> Well, we have a wealth of experience and expertise sitting on this couch today. Um, we're very lucky. And that first question that I asked, I asked about innovation. And I'm curious, just as a follow-up, some museums, some directors, have kind of a love-hate relationship with the term innovation. And I'm wondering, how do you approach innovation? Do you have any type of maybe visceral reaction to what it means to innovate? Are you parsing what that term actually means in your organizations? You know, coming from a creative industries background in the end, and I've been working for, um, as, as, as we did the design festival, this was the creative industry funding organizations were big partners. You started hating innovation because <laughs> it was, uh, it became such a pressure as a tool, you know, that that's what it's all right. about. And, and I think one of the things I, 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 I love and hate about museums is that they're super slow, so that it takes a long time to transform and move forward, but it has benefits that it, that it takes that time. Um, uh, at the same time, of course, uh, it, I'm not sure if it's in, innovation, but I would rather ask myself how how do we have to change to stay relevant? Yeah, is uh, is is because we're not a startup. We are obviously the opposite of a startup. I would say we're uh, the um, slow up. I don't know how you would call that. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a little different approach because sure. I'm head of a museum, and that museum only exists since uh, 2015. It was mm -hmm. opened in May 2015. We are eight years old now. And I always feel we are working a little mm -hmm. bit like a startup mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we are still um, uh, like organizing processes which are in uh, big and old museums are normal and the saying we've always done that, mm -hmm. we have never experienced that. Yeah. So yeah. we had to be innovative um, basically all the time. For me, it's the other way around. I tr now try to, to stop being innovative <laughs> because it's a, it's a great challenge for the team also. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to, um, you know, to maybe take the level where we are now a little bit for granted, but it's really a very special thing because we are also a museum. We don't have a very big collection. We mm -hmm. uh, work with permanent loans. And um, so, yeah, it, it works differently. And I think there are mm -hmm. several different museums, kind of museums, mm -hmm. like, Museum with collection, with big collection, with small collection, new museums, old museums, so it's always a little bit different. Yeah. Maybe I would just have to add, we do a lot of crazy stuff all the yes. time, yeah? <laughs> that's, that's what we're doing. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we love uh, doing that because uh, I think it's also, also in, in behind the, the scenes trying, you know, thinking new ways of how museums should, you know, yeah, change in a way to yeah. stay relevant. But I, I sometimes really also am happy that the pressure is not to be the most innovative uh, institution like, I don't know, a, a telecommunication company. I have no clue. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. relieves me, I have to say. And to, to be honest, in the museum world, your museum is really innovative. <laughs> we, uh, it's my, uh, okay, my opinion, my personal, <laughs> really. <laughs> trying things and all that. I mm -hmm. think that that shows something you said. We are not not a not a startup, and yes, your museum in Lübeck is quite new. I think um, if innovation is interpreted as tearing down everything and starting all over, then museums can't be innovative, and that's what I don't like about the term. Mm. Um, but um, 
to reinvent um, an institution again and again on the basis of what it, it started off and, and um, on also critical question but also respect the tradition it stems from to respect the cultural heritage it has in this, in this wall um, and, and create innovative new words from that point, starting point, that's what I, I love about museums because they can do so. And the Übersee Museum is, is a, for that a very good example because it was founded at the end of the 19th century and the idea from the very start was to, to show present time. I mean, you can, in the, in, the, in the 21st century, you can take objects from the 19th century and, and, and tell stories of the 19th century or from the 70s or from wherever the objects are. But in the Übersee Museum, the goal was always to tell stories of nowadays. And that's from the very start. And because of that, and taking that tradition seriously, we have to question in the Übersee Museum as curators, we have to question ourselves and our collections and exhibitions again and again to ask ourselves, is this still present day? Is this modern time? Is this relevant? Are the questions we ask the relevant questions of people living today? And then taking our, in part, very old collections and, and using them to reinterpret and, uh, um, and, and reinterpret new questions which our predecessors couldn't have, didn't have, didn't, didn't ask or didn't want to answer. So, um, and that makes an institution like the Übersee Museum uh, innovative in, in, a, in a certain sense and we question ourselves and that this is something which, and that I think it's probably for you museum, it's a different, same, same, but different. It's um, um, that this is in the gene, it's in the DNA of the museum. So people in the Übersee Museum, and that's what I love about my institution, that's the reason why I'm there for more than 20 years, is that um, my colleagues are with me all the time on the move. They're very open-minded to change and to question uh, their work and to say, well, let's, let's do it differently. And then we take the big ship and move it to another direction. And that, of course, takes time. It's, it's, uh, it's a big ship right. and it needs a bit time to, to move. But that makes also sure that we don't jump on every new trend popping up, which a startup can do and my, sometimes and the startup leaves again, but we have to continue now for more than 125 years and we would like to continue for another 125 years. So we have to maneuver with care and for that it's good to have a big ship. You have three people sitting here on this couch that represent quite different unusual types, as not unusual in the sense of unusual, but <coughs> very often, or at least <coughs> a certain kind of people associate with museums, art museums, mm -hmm. and we are, we are representing another kind of collection and, and a different typology of museum. And each of us is probably constantly um, confronted with the question, how do we you know, rethink ourselves and question ourselves? Because it's not given that mm. people think, oh, that's cool to go, I know what it's about, uh, and I'll you know, go there as often as I can, whereas the canon of the arts uh, um, and the old art scene and everything is a given. You know, you don't question if somebody makes a Picasso exhibition or a Beckman exhibition, nobody, <laughs> I just wonder why do they make so many Picasso and Beckman exhibitions, but it's just <laughs> me. Uh, the rest says, oh, I know it's Beckman, Max Beckman, so I go. Oh, I know it's Caspar David Friedrich, so I go. And, and this, is a, this means that all these type of museums, um, and it's very often, not seen by the public nor the nor the media, particularly the media, that we have to <coughs> we have to argue very differently. We have to question mm. our work very differently. We have to continuously reinvent our work mm. because it's not a given. Yeah, nobody says, "Oh, I always wanted to see baroque furniture." It's why um, very few people do, to be honest. Hans history. Yeah, exactly. Hans <laughs> history. Yes. Oh, how great. What do Push, push it higher, <laughs> yeah. ethnographic collection. Exactly, <laughs> we all wanted to do that. <laughs> because that, that's, I would say, in the, in the social anthropology, uh, we, uh, it's a field with, I, I would say we, we quest, um, question ourselves most in comparison to other Absolutely. academic fields. Um, and we, we are the ones really questioning what are, are we doing, um, what kind of collections can we keep? Which have we to return? How can we interpret these these objects? Um, can we um, 
um, present something, how, how representation could be. So it's a constant mm -hmm. questioning themselves and what, what we are doing. And for that, um, you started the collaboration point. It's, uh, collaborations are in, in highly important and that's why, why we are working together <laughs> in, in our new collection project or we are in the Übersee Museum very strongly at, for some years now with Oceania. Um, mm -hmm. Really to get um, new partners, new ways of interpreting, new ways of developing further mm -hmm. our, our exhibitions, our, our databases, our working together uh, with partners of the communities of origin. Mm -hmm. And that's a perfect segue to our next question because reinvention takes another you know, C word, you know, <coughs> it takes courage. And to do that, it means reaching out to, to various communities. So can you share an example of a project, a successful project or initiative where either your museum or a museum that you know of has incorporated input from visitors or local communities um, in their implementation of either new technologies or practices? Mm -hmm. Tolga, would you like to start? Um, well, probably our um, our most successful project is not is super analog and not digital at all. Even so, through Neo Collections, we reached out to very interesting communities from far abroad. Some of them are guests here, which makes us very happy. Um, but the, the Freiraum, which is uh, the main space uh, <coughs> in the center of the museum, which we opened autumn 2020, is now over the last uh, you know, two and a half years become a very natural space for communities to use um, at different times of the day or week. So that is um, a project where I'm super proud of that through uh, the curatorial program, but, but it's never so oppressive that people feel intimidated to come. So there is enough space and time and openness there for different communities to come and use it for different reasons, yeah? and, or just go there and have a rest or, or meet somebody. And um, this uh, is yeah, something that makes me happy because it changes all the time. It always looks a little bit different and then there's like a tiny pop-up presentation or somebody working or you meet different generations there um, during the week. So I think, um, and it's an ongoing project, so it doesn't mean that we have reached anything. And it's also what I find so interesting about that is it's, um, uh, I always say it's an outreach project, even so there was never the word outreach written anywhere. Mm -hmm. and, but it also is an in-reach project because it has effects on our work as well mm -hmm. as it does. So, so there are communities from outside coming in, but at the same time what the Freiraum is doing or what kind of communities are coming, projects that come out of that also influence what we are doing and at the same time what we are doing also influences the Freiraum. And so it's like a, it's like a, a membrane uh, between out and in and I think that's quite an interesting project. Yeah. And do you use it as, as a team also for They do, team also, meetings, yes, for sometimes we do. I mean, we do have a conference room so um, for, for more intimate meetings, um, but people would say, um, oh, you know, somebody else comes in and you say, let's meet downstairs mm -hmm. and okay. just meet mm -hmm. there, or you don't have the conference room so you just sit down and mm -hmm. have a meeting there, so yes, absolutely. And do you have communities t uh, in getting involved um, uh, we reach changing it and, and developing it further or is it more they accept it and work with it and well it, it, it's, it depends on the kind of project I mean sometimes it's uh, that it's it's already like the idea of the Freiraum itself saying we're doing this curatorial project with that community mm -hmm. and then it does have a temporarily effect on how the room is maybe you know okay. displayed yeah. used whatever uh, at the same time, of course, it also changes because uh, it's, it's in a, some things are static, but it, others are in, in, in flux somehow because people would more need, more in, so something moves so they can be more intimate or something like that. Mm. It's not that the communities are, are redesigning the space, that mm. I wouldn't say, but the space is designed in a way that it can react to certain needs. Okay. And what That's about great. that interaction mm -hmm. with external communities or practitioners that maybe are not part of that hyper local audience or communities that would be a part of that analog or physical experience? So I'm thinking, you know, specifically how you involve those groups in, in projects like the Neo Collections project. Would you mind elaborating on that as well? 
Well, in the Neo Collections project, we, we um, which, and, and, and Vipke has to tell more about how they uh, involve their fellows, uh, we, one of the important projects was to, to you know, make this call for the fellowship. Um, and we were really um, impressed uh, by from how far and from how many different backgrounds people you know apply to be <coughs> part of the fellowship and and what I find challenging and super inspiring at the same time because the the fellows had the opportunity to get in touch with people working inside the museum so um, and through that also getting in closer touch to, to the collection and, and, and questioning how we work or how the collection is displayed online or how it could be displayed or, or become more accessible online. And I think this is uh, a very, very valuable um, uh, project for us to learn instead of, for example, because you kind of mentioned that at the beginning, instead of saying, oh, we want the super high-tech solution to do that and that, and let's, you know, we have the money of the funding, so let's, mm -hmm. um, you know, commission one of the really, uh, the super kids to design something very shiny, rather get into this exchange and, and, and getting critical questions, mm -hmm. uh, and also sometimes, um, yeah, there was, a there was something resonating, I think, on both sides. What is still, what I still think is not so easy to, to, the, to bring this kind of format more into the museum. Mm -hmm. yeah? It sticks to certain people of the museum that are involved in it and are willing and open to be part of it, but it doesn't naturally resonate into the very de depth, you know, the next and the next and the next layer of the, of the staff, which is obvious, it's, it's an experiment. We, we're just touching certain, you know, moments. And I find it um, uh, very interesting and probably the next question of the next level, how do we really get these experiences and learnings into the museum. Right, to permeate. Mm -hmm. Vivka, would you like to share an example or project and maybe your involvement with the Neo Collections project? Yeah, it's um, um, <coughs> a mixture of Neo Collections and what we do in, with Oceania Digital. We started a project which started out to be a virtual exhibition, but it's it developed to something completely different. And this is, the difference is also made through Neo Collections. So it's, it's quite, it's, um, we, are, we are still looking for the right words to describe <laughs> what we are doing. But I would say um, what, what happens through this process with Neo Collections, especially with the fellowships, caused a sort of revolution in the Oberübersee Museum. Not to all employees, um, and, uh, but at least definitely to the curators, but also to the conservators and, and to the taxidermists there. We are really um, working dif differently with the collection. We are more focusing on the process mm -hmm. um, than on already knowing the result, what's coming out, or we are not producing something and then presenting it like an exhibition. You have the grand opening and then you wait. <laughs> Um, here we are more in a dialogue and a process and what we did and that's the examples you asked for, we, we developed together with our partners at the National University of Samoa in the Pacific, so it's really on the other side, really on mm -hmm. the other side of the world. Uh, we developed an, um, an idea how could we um, um, get people from Samoa engaged in our collection and not just university stuff, so not, not this academic bubble. Right real people from real wherever in right. Samoa. And we d developed um, two things. One is, um, it's called show and tell. Meyasina show and tell. Meyasina are um, treasures from Samoa. That's where we started. And the idea was how can we get, the, offer the possibility to see what we have from Samoa and our collections in the storerooms, in, locked away uh, to people in Samoa. So we left it to our partners in Samoa to invite um, weavers, um, 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 wood carvers, or whatever they thought is appropriate. And then we went to our visible storage and, and, and uh, to the closed parts and with an iPad and just said, what, what would you like to see? And then we, we picked, of course, at the, we started with 
sending them over in, in, in photos and information and then we decided together which kind of topics could be interesting like like dresses or wood carving or yeah. other, other things mm -hmm. and then we focus on that and then we said direct us with a camera what would you like to see and we it was a 3d exp life experience because then you really could dive into can you get closer to exactly <laughs> that part of the dress yes we can we can definitely and so um, it was really a, li a life experience, a life dialogue. It was on more on processes. It was um, um, we expected a lot of information to our historic collection, which wasn't there because it was very often disconnected over the 120 years. But it was new, uh, new information. It was in in real link to to uh, which is relevant for the people in Samoa nowadays. And, and they could um, rely back to, to objects they never have seen in their lifetime and which are in Bremen for more than 120 years. And that was an absolutely great experience which we now transfer to other parts and we'll have next week uh, together with a group from the Chatham Islands with, with the Moriori collection. Mm -hmm. and, and the other is that we um, created a Facebook page. That is something when we come to technology that we have certain ideas here in Europe which technologies are up to date, for whom, and what's um, hip. But, but we, we really had to look what are the people in the Pacific using, what kind of technologies work, because it's completely waste of money to develop here fancy things. And then you have partners in the Pacific using Facebook, having a an, 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 an smartphone, but no, no computer, and they have to see it all on a screen like that. You right. have That's to rethink that. It's important to take that, that into consideration. Yes, yeah, so, and, and so we, we created a Facebook page and have now um, um, more than 800 uh, uh, Samoans and all over the Pacific really being in contact with us on, um, on our collection, historic photographs and objects. And really, an, uh, it's an, an vivid di dialogue with, with people um, getting engaged in, um, in, in, our, in our collection and uh, via Facebook dialogue. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Felicia, what about you? Do you have a project or initiative that you would I, like to I, share? I read about a project of the Brooklyn Museum in New York. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, it was launched in uh, 2015. I've never experienced it <coughs> myself, unfortunately, but um, uh, w when you asked that question, it came across my mind. Um, it, they, they created an app also with their audience and with focus groups and so on um, to ask. It, it was called Ask. Yes, Maybe you my PhD. <laughs> I was in my really? PhD. You're kidding. <laughs> no, okay. uh, great example. I, I found, <laughs> no, I found that really interesting. Um, uh, they have a very go great art collection, I think, mm -hmm. and you could download that app and then walk through the museum and ask in real lifetime, in, in real <coughs> life, uh, and at the right at that moment um, about the uh, artwork where mm -hmm. you have the question why are there only men on the paintings <laughs> or uh, why are they always naked <laughs> or something like that and they did a, they also did a, um, a database I think yes. um, made out of these questions to uh, to be more um, relevant and to explain also to the visitors afterwards um, how it works and w what w what is uh, interesting mm -hmm. and uh, one thing was really funny because there was one curator of I think it was Egyptian art and a lot of these uh, stone uh, Egyptian portraits they're miss I don't know why I didn't get the answer but uh, they are missing their noses you know all the asterisks uh, <laughs> climbing on the we know the answer <laughs> okay we can come to that Obelix. <laughs> Obelix, yes <laughs> Yeah, he had a lot to do. <laughs> so, and the curator said, and that, that was really interesting, I've never thought about that because I have taken it as a given fact that there is no nose. Uh -huh. But I mean, if you're not uh, familiar with it, you first thing you ask, hey, why don't they have a nose? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a really nice project. I think they have not... Uh, uh, postponed it. They, they are not working on it anymore. No, but no, not but anymore. But that was a that was very. It's really what great. That interesting as well is that you could also you know think about the 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 collection and those questions outside of the geography of that museum. Yeah. So you could go home and after you were thinking or after the visit, you could you know ask the app the question and yeah. you didn't necessarily need to be in the museum to yeah. experience yeah. the museum. And that helped with bringing people visitors back.
And, and the, curator, great way. the curators answered that when they were in office or yes. in real yes. life time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you sent, you, you wrote a, a question and yeah, you got an email you, you back. You could talk to the, to the, the app speak also. Voice, mm. voice notes. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, it was it was highly innovative at the time. Yes. Yeah. 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 When was that? A Brooklyn uh, Museum. Yeah, but when? They uh, started 2015. 2015. Uh, 2015. Yeah. And yeah. I think it went, it went for I think like, like 2017, 2018. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so as we you know, think about engagement from the outside inside, now let's maybe talk, shift gears a bit and think about what that engagement, that collaboration looks like, feels like inside our organizations and, and the effects of these new practices. So can you share any strategies or policies that you've implemented within your organizations or how your organizations plan to support work-life balance for yourself your staff and museum workers in general, particularly as emerging technologies and new practices increase the demand for flexibility and adaptability. And maybe, Felicity, can we start with you? Because you yes. wrote a very interesting article January of this year about your your career and your work-life <laughs> balance and oh, how yes. you kind of come across yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Uh, my work-life balance is right now not very good, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, I think it's a very relevant topic now, um, especially um, looking at younger p persons uh, willing to work in the, in, in the museum field. Um, I think it has a lot to do with flexibility. Um, you know, have working models where you can do your work when you want to do it, not only when the museum is open, for example. Um, you have to, I think, um, you have to talk about the topic a lot mm -hmm. with, your, with your staff, with your team and um, discuss these, uh, these challenges w w because they are there. I, I have the feeling that in the museums most people are really working there because they are so engaged and they, they love their work and they tend to do a lot, uh, they tend to do too much. Um, so in my team, we are regularly doing, for example, in my, uh, we have a round where the head of the, the teams uh, meet every two weeks. And first thing we do, we make a check in and ask, how are you? And we really mean it. And we don't want to ask, well, how's, how's the work? And are you uh, coping with it? No, we really want to know what's on with you apart from work. Um, has your cat died or your child is not, uh, good in childcare and is mm -hmm. right now <coughs> things like that because they um, uh, inflict your work. Yes. Uh, th that is very important and what we also did with my team, we are doing some every regularly now, it's called team-centered um, uh, team -centered interaction, team-centered interaction and uh, where we, where we um, it's a guided circle and we, we talk about things which have not to do with the work Bec and we, we try, to, um, try to get to the ground what is not working very good uh, in our collaboration. And I think that's very important because, you know, um, getting things done is really very important, but that's only the, the highest top of the iceberg. And all the problems which are there lie beneath uh, the sea level. And uh, I think it's important to start to talk about these things, too. Mm -hmm. um, feedback is important, um, you know, uh, yes, that, that are some ideas, at least. Dialogue, for Dialogue. sure. Dialogue, yeah. oh, yes, yeah. Tolga, what about yourself? Um, yeah. I. I find super interesting what you're saying. Um, I think we can learn <coughs> from you. Um, I would like to add that, that we have these two things. One is uh, exactly what you said. People in museums, usually a lot of them work out of dedication and passion for mm. the theme. Therefore, they tend to do too much, then too little. Plus, they're, um, they're ambitious. Yeah? They also want to show and glow. Uh, but the other thing that I find also very difficult um, is the way that um, our the the outside world, in our case, let's say the um, the money giving as the funding part, the the governmental structure, um, the expectations, all number based. Yeah, so. Um, they would ask, you know, what are, what are the goals we have to reach? Such and such number of visitors, such and such numbers mm. of exhibitions, mm. such and such, um, you know, percentage of income um, versus that. And this whole system, um, it, 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 it puts a lot of pressure on, on cultural institutions like that because it's all they, they are counting. Yeah? So I find it um, important to 
to to develop um, uh, some kind of you know um, to defend the institution, saying no, we don't have to do that many exhibitions. Let's mm. do less exhibitions. Mm. We do mm. not have to change exhibitions mm. every three months. Mm. Let's, if of out of conservatory reasons possible, make it five to six months. Yeah, we let's do less. Let's start thinking about other things we could do um, in order to to slow things down. Bec and 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 in the end, also have a political debate about this because. Um, for some reason, the the whole idea of art cultural institutions to be in a in a competition with other cultural institutions, saying, okay, who has the most, the best, the biggest, the mm -hmm. the, the most important, um, whatever kind of blockbuster exhibition, the biggest numbers of visitors? Oh, I'm big, I'm bigger than you, and I find it also very male uh, kind <laughs> of uh, debate. But and and this is um, something that we have to, yeah to really relearn or, or, or start to unlearn it mm -hmm. and, and say, no, less is good. And it's more mm -hmm. about having, like, that was also part of the debate here, have a more, in, you know, more intense and long-term relationship to people that come to our museum instead of the, the biggest numbers. Yeah? I prefer to have people coming back and saying, oh, it's my favorite house. I come here regularly than um, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, just have, um, Super big numbers, mm -hmm. also under under sustainable. You know, today it's also well-being is a topic of the oh, day, yes. and under understandings of well-being and sustainability, uh, I would say that um, having you know really looking at impact than output is something we have to learn. And otherwise, in in talking about flexibility and the way I find it, of course, also important that we. That was something that the pandemic really changed, that we are more flexible, mm. uh, but we have to remind um, um, everybody again and again that to turn it off on weekends <laughs> and, and, and oh, evenings and say yes. no. And, and I sometimes I'm the ho most horrible person because then I write uh, something on a on a holiday and say, I'm so sorry dis disturbing you, but I forget the moment I'm back in the office, so I have to write it now, you don't have to answer. Yeah, yeah. We're all learning new habits <laughs> and, and, and how, to, how to flex. And I think one of the most interesting things that you, just, that you just shared there is it's moving beyond transactions and moving into more interactions so that you can establish those, mm -hmm. those long-term relationships. And that is definitely something that is a, a behavior or a practice that needs to be continuously mm -hmm. practiced. And yeah. when we're surrounded by very commercial endeavors, it can be hard to, to kind of get out of that mindset. Mm -hmm. Vipka, what about yourself? Listening to my colleagues, I, um, <coughs> I really think that for the museum world, this uh, work-life balance, it's not a good term, uh, because it suggests that work isn't life. Mm -hmm. But we all spend more of, uh, most of our life working. Um, so I, I, I don't like this. It's, um, this cre it's the idea that life starts when I leave work. Mm. So I think, and listening to you, it, I get strengthened in that idea that we should talk more about well-being mm -hmm. in the museum. I have, as an employer, I have to make sure that my employees don't have, it's not my fault if they work all the time overtime. I have really to see that they manage their work in the, in the time span they are hired for. And of course, then we all love to have leisure time on a Sunday afternoon and do things which are just fun and, and fancy. Um, but but uh, in the museum, I have to make sure that well-being is a topic. Um, but I think we should really step, in, in the museum world, step away from this work-life balance. Of course, we all have to work to earn money for our living. Uh, but we in the museum. Most of our uh, people working here are really in the museum because they, that was their dream of their life. They want to work in the museum. So that's their life. And, and um, yeah. I go in circles. No, so. no, <laughs> I, I completely concur. I think I think it's you know what Felicia you know said to to kind of get us started with this question is that we have to recognize that no matter how many boundaries we set or what what we think happens when we enter our workplace you know facility that we don't stop becoming who we are. We are bringing our whole selves to work and figuring out ways in which we do that in. In, a, in respect and in collaboration and in community with others and what does that entail? And I think that's a really good question for us to continue mm -hmm. to explore and interrogate and challenge the words that are associated with mm -hmm. it. 
So this is now our time. Um, I'm going to ask one final question of our panelists, and then I'm going to open it up to you to ask questions. So um, we've mentioned the, the Neo Collections project, and uh, you can find on the Neo Collections Medium blog, we have several interviews with the fellows and their projects. And this next question is inspired um, from the fellows, Derek Arma and Tara Okeke. How do, you, how do we cultivate deep listening practices in our institutions for greater connection, communication, and collaboration to reflect the lived experience and expertise of our communities? Which one of you would like to tackle that first? Deep, li deep listening. Deep listening. You've mentioned a couple, dialogue has been mm. a huge part of today's conversation. How are we really flexing those active listening skills? How are we building those active listening skills in our organizations? Maybe I jump up Please. with an, um, two of the fellows of Neo Collections, um, Hine Moana Baker and Emily Killing. Um, they worked on the question of metadata on the database. Um, and the result um, were um, a set of poems mm -hmm. where they brought two objects of our collection into a dialogue. And listening to that poem in one of um, the presentations of the Neo mm -hmm. collection prototypes was still, and still is a prototype, I was absolutely flushed. Mm -hmm. Because and when I started working in the museum, there's always a saying of the objects have to speak. But obviously, objects don't speak. <laughs> I, I have to make them speak. <laughs> Um, and, and now it's always, as me, as a German curator, I'm, am I allowed to let an object speak? Here suddenly there were um, two poets um, from, from the Pacific um, who made let objects speak, getting in a dialogue about their experience of being in Germany, um, having a colonial past, having seen bloody mm. things. Um, so a quite emotional experience where objects suddenly spoke. Um, and, um, jewelry and a belt. And I said, well, this has to come out of the digital world into the physical world. So we started working together with um, Hinemoana and Emilicia and seeing how can we bring this slowly digital idea into the physical space of our new permanent exhibition. And what we are underway and creating is a space where visitors can sit in I always, I, they, you really feel housed and you have, have a backrest and, and you sit in, in sort of a bowl. And then the center, of course, are the two, two objects. And you can listen um, to the poems, uh, four poems will, it will be at the end, um, where these objects are in a dialogue with each other. So you, you talk about the dark side of colonialism, you listen to the dark side, you, you are invited to talk to each other listening to the poems. So it's an emotional way, um, not an overload of that, but, but you really are invited to sit down and take your time to listen to four poems. And then we said, well, if it's in the physical space, it shouldn't end with listening and seeing. We have other senses. So we discussed that objects have also the resonance of a smell. And we started discussing with Emilicia what, what is the resonance if you see, you don't smell it, it you see a belt uh, from Punape. And he said, well, I, I smell a different kind of herbs and flowers. I have the smell of fish and the smell of babies. So now we are creating <laughs> a smell station. Um, I still hope we get the smell of babies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a very and I said, well, yeah. I, and I asked him, is it a problem that like you here in the auditorium, that people will start laughing, giggling a little bit mm -hmm. when there is a smell of babies. And they said, no, no, that's fine. It's fine. It's really a resonance on this old belt I, I, I have. And um, we already figured that baby powder is combining us on two sides of the, the world. So it will be a resonance which we have here and there. And of course, we are still seeing that um, a jade stone um, needs to be worn on the body. It needs the warmth of the body and then it ca catches the warmth and it has a certain touch to it. So we're now thinking of what kind of stone we can put a jade in, in, as a touch object in, in, in the exhibition. What kind of object, what kind of stone could be that people could put their hands on 
to get this feeling mm. of the warmth of, of, a, of a green stone worn on your body. So really to think of how can we really make an emotional, almost all around, there's nothing to lick, but then we have all senses around. <laughs> um, how, how can we bring this to an all, um, all, all around experience and, and at the same moment create an, an area of comfort for an uncomfortable topic, but an area of comfort, comfort where people are really invited to sit and spend time and listening that I would say if it works out, it will be deep listening. It will be de absolutely <laughs> deep listening. It's really <laughs> touching to, to mm -hmm. imagine that, yeah, getting poems um, you know, recited to you from people that have the, uh, you know, kind of the, the authority to, to, to talk about that. I thought it was super, super interesting. Yeah. It's probably one of the biggest questions is uh, I sometimes question if we should, um, you know, shrink rather than grow, I find mm. it to 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 think about how can we, you know, do do less and more, <coughs> more, you know, more int intense and uh, and maybe that's also another thing that is so part of our time that we are, you know, we are so overwhelmed of of the speed, the and and the amount of information mm -hmm. and everything that you know gets spilled and thro thrown at us and yelled at us in a way. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It's also so loud and, and museums are luckily not loud, but they're still, um, the way they were founded was about collecting and gathering and having more and more and maybe it's about having less and, and, um, and doing exactly that, yeah? uh, showing less but in a different way yeah? and, and opening up spaces where it's not about you know, endless um, you know, stroll where you think, mm -hmm. oh, I cannot, I just come back from the Venice Biennale and, and after, you know, the second day I was like, the first day I was absorbing, absorbing, absorbing and the second mm -hmm. day I was half, after half a day I was like, I cannot read and that the text anymore, yeah, so um, still was very inspiring. So creating more of an intimate experience, yeah, I think, maybe, for both, right? Maybe that's Create open spaces to mm -hmm. have the possibility to, to learn, to listen, I think that's important. Uh, that's what uh, as Anne just said, um, listening to, to the communities which are mm -hmm. relevant, for example, and um, have the possibilities, give the possibility and um, reflect on that. I think that's, that's really important. Yeah. All right, now we'd like to open it up to the audience. Does anybody have a question? We have time for a question or two before we, before we break. Don't be so shy. I do have some in reserve. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, thank you very much for the discussion so far. Uh, it's a question, I guess, for Wiebke Arndt and Felicia Sternfeld, as you are the two representatives of the um, huge museum organizations, and you talked about uh, new mu museum practices in your own museums. But I was wondering, um, what can you do as a museum organization to foster uh, such things, like in the whole, and all different types of uh, museums? So before we answer that, just so I can capture it for the for the recording, because we have the mics. <laughs> um, so, what is the role of of the museum associations, the museum professional organizations, in in thinking about these new practices? I think we have to work on it also um, in the way we work with our members, for example, to be more open, more transparent um, and uh, put into discussion and into, into public discussion all the topics which are relevant, which we discuss now. Um, I think that's the most important thing. And I mean, we, we even touched the 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 um, the top right now, but there are so many other questions which are relevant, and um, yeah, we uh, yeah we have to take uh, that into account. We have to organize events about that, talk about it, and uh, yeah. And I think the 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 ICOM uh, particularly had a big fight on what is the the you know the definition. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> and the uh, new definition is r really helpful because yes. uh, it goes exactly. li really a little <coughs> bit further than the old one. Exactly. Sustainability is in it, for example, and uh, it's a participative right now. You should work as a museum, and mm -hmm. th th that is the good basis for 
um, for all these questions. Um, we will have, um, as I come, uh, have a German uh, translation. We are working on that right now. We have been asked all the time, where is the German translation? Uh, we have a lunch break, a little <laughs> advertisement here on 6th of, uh, 6th of June, and we will d discuss with our members uh, a German translation. And when you start discussing the, the, the singular terms, then it's really interesting. Mm. You could you'd already do an interpretation, of course. Mm. And so th this is really important, yeah. Yeah, um, the German Museum Association publishes on a very regular basis guidelines mm. um, for its members, but they are open source on the website on um, several topics, sometimes together with ICOM on the standards, um, sometimes alone, but um, on, on different, different issues of the museum world. So you can have these guidelines there. And then we have an annual meeting every, um, once a year. It's um, last one was just two weeks ago in Osnabrück. Um, on um, climate change and sustainability, um, really discussing what can museums do to reduce its CO2 footprint, which has to be done, definitely. Um, and we are already in planning the next annual meeting, which, which will be in Aschaffenburg, and uh, it will be on the topic how can museums be more resilient in crisis, mm -hmm. because this is an experience we just all had in Corona, and we are absolutely sure on the association side that uh, it won't be the last um, catastrophe uh, coming over. So we have to be resilient. Mm -hmm. And so these are then always issues we pick once a year, uh, focusing on publishing on um, the Museumskunde on the same topic. Uh, but the guidelines, I would say, is for um, the, the most of the museums and we have, which is a bit shocking, already more than 7,400 museums in Germany. It's constantly getting more. Um, and uh, more than half of them are very, very small museums. Mm. Um, and uh, they are happy to have these um, guidelines in profession more working more professionally, and especially the, since they have a lot of volunteers, will, uh, people who were never trained in museum world and which, uh, who need these guidelines uh, to uh, get a really an idea how, how do I handle objects, what is a collection strategy, and so on. Who else would like to? ask a question. Anyone? Please. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Constantina and uh, I have been a fellow uh, in the Neolab project with NKNG uh, Museum. So I would like to, to place a question that still preoccupies me and my partner. And it has to do with inclusiveness and uh, how can we be more inclusive in our narratives when talking about uh, human interaction between objects and visitors and um, just to, to frame it, with Tonya we worked, uh, we, we have been paired with the directors of the Freyram space. And uh, our main task was to facilitate uh, the storytellings between the visitors and the digital objects. So, uh, actually it was a difficult task because we hadn't seen the Freyram. So, when we, we got the idea, you know, by following uh, the whole process of uh, li deep listening and online conversations, we understood that uh, the digital objects were not in the fray realm. And we began to ask ourselves also, who are the visitors, uh, the visitors of the fray realm? So we, we had to step back, which is really interesting, because um, sometimes you have to do maybe a step back in order to then to uh, overcome the obstacles. And we begin to, to reimagine um, this interaction by bringing, in an inclusive way, the sum of the objects in the fray realm. So where we stand now, we have uh, we thought with Tonya that uh, if people have the chance to, to talk about the objects, but also feel represented by the objects, and that means being able to express them themselves, no matter the gender identity, the gender expression, their ethnicity or social class, this would make much more easier the relationship between objects, digital or physical, whatever, and the human interaction. And we are working right now with uh, creative technologies in creating uh, some way QR codes to incorporate in the fray realm with provocations, some questions that will maybe um, make people feel free to go to, 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 to explore the QR code and then try to, to, to express themselves by storytelling. But still, we are not sure that uh, 
this will end up in an inclusive way of dealing with objects. So I would like to ask you also, what do you think about uh, inclusive narratives and inclusiveness when talking about uh, objects and human interaction? So the questions around more inclusive narratives in practice. Tolga, would you like to take that one first? Okay, what a difficult question. <laughs> oh my a God. Very, we should have probably started with that question. <laughs> you can say Obviously, it's a big challenge uh, because we are not, I think one of the answers is that by, n by n nature of, of training, um, as being trained for different parts of museum jobs. Yeah? I mean, a museum is not consisting only of that kind of job or only of that kind of job. So you have a lot of different people that are working with collections or trying to then uh, communicate, convey, or tell stories about collections, and they have big different backgrounds. So the training is not yet there to, to for example, include inclusiveness as, a, as an attitude immediately. Yeah? Uh, so it's already, I find, uh, interesting something I, I very often say is that, um, and, and then the other thing is maybe that's very German, I, I'm not sure, or also Austrian as a German language based uh, kind of thing, that um, people from an academic background um, in, in museums, in my opinion, uh, sorry, I hope I'm not in insulting anybody uh, in the room, but uh, they, they very often have this um, you know, the, the, to be very objective because they're, you know, they're researchers and academic and that's how they talk. So they are not, you cannot, you know, cannot really grasp the person behind. So the language is um, neutral, object, you know, very and, and clearly um, based on knowledge. Yeah? Uh, but it, uh, besides the fact that, of course, you, 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 you constantly work, work on the fact, how do we write a text? So people from all s levels can really understand and read it, it still is um, sometimes very detached from, from um, other people. So uh, I always say that the museum is not talking, it's people that are talking, and, and it's totally okay. I find it totally fine that a, you know, a highly qualified researcher talks in a certain way about, um, unless you make the language in a way that everybody can understand it. So it's... Um, we are not yet there, I would say, to be able in understanding different personas and different, um, uh, to really go into these, you know, different roles and positions and or put on different glass, glasses to see, look at an object. I mean, what, what Vipke, when you, when you talked about how your connection uh, to the people of the Samoan Islands, how they started, you know, to look at objects and talk about it, that's, that's a certain kind of inclusiveness. We, are ma hopefully, I guess, something that comes out of it, the poem or whatever. Um, we are a museum of applied arts. We, we have, um, so we, we discuss that internally. Also, how do we, how do we evolve the collection? Um, who is not represented in the collection, for example? Um, meaning, um, I would always say that it's our super important goal that we are about high quality of design. That is like a given, but still we have to look, why are we not looking at certain parts of the world that do brilliant design and we are super, you know, ignorant as Europeans being so centered on Europe and not seeing the other, again, just came back from the Venice Biennale, it's all about black Africa and um, black America and it's amazing, um, got home with the term, that Leslie Loco, the commissioner, says, you always say we are the minority, but we are the majority. And I thought, yes, God learned that now. Um, amazing work we've seen there. So there's a lot to learn, I would say. I would start at the, but that's a very general thing. I, I find it extremely important that in the, in the training, in the education of museum people, we have to change things to, from there to then, you know, slowly. Because you always have to also <coughs> see the other challenge. Um, I find it really important to understand with all the new challenges we have that the, the society is putting one layer after the other and expecting new things the museum to deliver. Yeah? A long time ago it was, you know, this museum was about collecting <coughs> exemplary objects of design. 
Um, and give, hand, that was actually the most interactive kind of museum you could think of because it was always connected to the, art, to the design schools, to the Kunstgewerbe Schule. So the collection was used as a material to learn. So another part, you know, another idea I would have to, be, to really foster inclusiveness is to take objects that we have, you know, doubles and, and triples wise, where you say, okay, we have six times the same chair, let's take five of the, and only keep one, and then work with young people and take it apart to understand how it's built. That I would find very inclusive because suddenly people could touch it and understand it and work with it. But um, the, all these expectations that we have to deliver, you know, being, being becoming more diverse, making provenance research, um, being digital, um, being you know super well, being in social media, having a good website, having very good ed education, all these things came on top of you know on one after the other. Uh, now, of course, being you know decolonializing the collection, super important, and I agree on every one of them. We just never got the, the staff and we never got to, to do it and, and, and the staff is still not, um, as in our field, not educated well enough to do it. Yeah? So it's super, a, there are a lot of many challenges coming, um, being, a pro, you know, being put on us and said, oh, but you have to do this. And I say, yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, we have to be more inclusive um, and uh, we wish to try it out. Um, but you also have to make sure that your people go with you, that you don't lose them because they're totally uh, you know, frustrated and say, okay, I, I can't follow you anymore. I mean, I don't know what we you're doing. We just had that topic. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I think, yes, um, I'm absolutely uh, necessary and, and a very slow process to, to get there. But isn't one aspect also maybe a diverse team? It's not only about education, but a diverse team from different backgrounds. Um, and then you don't have to um, make, a, make a call to Oceania, <laughs> but maybe have somebody work uh, who, who comes from there or has experience so with that. I, I know, I know. But um, it could be one aspect in being more in, uh, inclusive, of course. I think then we, we end up, and but then it will be evening. Um, mm -hmm. and we would have to define what inclusive actually mean. Who are we going to include? Mm -hmm. uh, because this is not a homogeneous somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge, um, diverse group of people. And, and that makes it even more difficult. So are we more inclusive? Um, to the to the people where in, in the international collections they are, uh, the objects are stemming from, or is it more being inclusive on not so high educated people usually not coming to our institutions? Would we like to include them? And what you said, Holga, I totally agree. We have this informative way um, of talking, but what I also see is with this international collection. Doesn't matter if it's natural science, which I have, and I have all these animals and plants <laughs> in my museum as well, and the ethnographic objects, that most of the visitors don't know what they see. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a curator, or uh, if working in the educational department, first thing you do, you, you are in an explanatory mode. And this is an experience we also had with the Pacific, that since these objects were disconnected for more than 100 years, it was our Samoan curator, who had first to give explanations on what, what he could found about these objects in, in the archives before the discussion could start. And for me, this is always a certain gap, um, because what you really would like to, would like to engage with the visitors right away, you would like to start a, a discussion with school kids. What, what do you see? What does it make with you? Uh, but you're very often in a situation that you first start explaining several things because otherwise you stand there and say well make, a, make an educated guess what you think what it is mm -hmm. and then you can maybe can start a playful discussion on that because m uh, most visitors really really don't know uh, it's it's um, not out of their life experience and, and and some of the animals are absolutely unknown in Europe so they see them for the first time and think well you, you look curious but who the heck you? What, what? Who are you? And from where are you? And what are you doing? And can you buy it? <laughs> what I've really appreciated about this conversation, um, and as we wrap up our our conversation today, is is that we are expressing, um, I think, 
not necessarily a degree of confidence, but a level of courage and consideration of how we start to make these changes, that not everything is done. And as we've said before, whether we're talking about the museums or the organizations, supporting organizations, or even um, you know, the, the schools that train you know, those people that, that come into these positions, they are massive and they take a lot of time to change. And mm -hmm. it's really thinking through what are the right steps? How are we taking those steps? How are we including more people in the conversation about how those steps are taken? Um, and I think this has been an important conversation in that we haven't come up with all the answers. There are a lot of questions still to be, still to be had. And I think that's a very healthy way um, to, to, to end tonight's conversation. I'm gonna ask one final lightning round question and I'm gonna give our panelists uh, a second to think about it. Um, what do you wish for in your organization or the cultural sector? What do you wish for as far as change? Maybe That's easy. Oh, easy. Yeah, doing less. Doing less. Yeah. <laughs> if you wanna big, take- big, big, big topic in our museum, doing really less. Yeah, doing less. Yeah. If you want to take a second to, to just <laughs> think about that answer, um, we've talked a lot tonight, uh, or we've mentioned a lot tonight about the Neo Collections project, and you can find more about this project in progress on Medium, on their blog. But they've also just recently published a toolkit, and you can find that on pubpub.org. And the Neo Collections toolkit is a work in progress, serving um, a as a comprehensive resource for organizations seeking to adopt user-centered, explorative, open and reusable approaches to digital museum collections. Inspired by the pioneering Neo Collections project and with the guidance from Adavi Gandhi, the toolkit um, provides practical guidance, case studies, and best practices to help other cultural organizations transform their curatorial practices and their engagement with the visitors. So you can find out more about this toolkit on PubPub or go to uh, Medium to find out more about the Neo Collections project. And you can join the current Neo Collections partners in their transformative journey as they reshape the future of the museum collections and making them accessible, inclusive, and ever evolving. So, wishing. Do more with less. Okay, now the pressure's on. Tolga and Vipka, what would you, what would you add? Well, you give me so much time now, I have two wishes. Oh, okay, <laughs> let's go for it. <laughs> two wishes. I will be a genie and maybe you can One, one wish is that what we, we have started um, and working with the Pacific can be continued um, to other regions of the world, to other mm -hmm. projects. It's not something where the funding ends suddenly, uh, yeah. everything ends, so that this can continue. And this mm -hmm. is connected with the next wish I sometimes it's not a wish, oh, it's a wish. I, I sometimes question myself, um, w what would be possible if um, me, my, my, myself, and but also parts of my team would have more time to be creative than thinking about money which we don't have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think both, both of the wishes are super valuable and probably, a, you know, also something we are thinking of. I, I, uh, I also sometimes wish to be liberated from certain um, pressures that we are under to, to really work in a creative way. Yeah, to to, you know, have the freedom of, um, do, to, to not not in a not in a closed shop in an open shop with others to um, rethink what what we are f here for. Excellent. Being unchained. <laughs> Being unchained. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank everybody that joined us today, and I'd like to thank our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause for their time and expertise, experience. Thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy your evening.